What a song of delight in that city so bright, where we wept in neath heaven's fair dome. How the ransomed will raise happy songs in his praise, when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's God singers get home, whenever a sorrow or heartache will come, there'll be no place like heaven, my home, when all of God's singers get home. As we sing here on earth, songs of sadness or mirth, tis a foretaste of rapture to come. But our joy can't compare with the glory up there, when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, when never a sorrow or heartache will come, there'll be no place like heaven, my home, when all of God's singers get home. Having overcome sin, hallelujah, amen, will be heard in that land or the foe. Every heart will be light and his face will be bright when all of God's singers get home. When all of God's singers get home, Whenever a sorrow or heartache will come, there'll be, no there'll be no place like heaven, my home, when all of God's singers get home. Some glad morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly, fly away, fly away. To a home on God's celestial shore, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away. In the morning, when I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. When the shadows of this life have grown, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars is blown, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Just a few more weary days and then. Shall never end. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. I'll fly away, fly away. Oh glory, I'll fly away, fly away in the morning. When I die, hallelujah, by and by. I'll fly away, fly away, fly away. Fly away, fly away, fly away. to view. All will be clearer, love 
loved ones be dearer in heaven where all will be made dear. We want to welcome everyone to our Wednesday night devotional. And uh, I know we got a lot of people that are out of town at church camp, things of that nature, but it is good to see you. And uh, a lot of things that are still going on. We do have um, several to remember in our prayers. Uh, we want to remember uh, Renee Crosby Beretta. I uh, asked if we would uh, especially remember her in our prayers, and so we definitely want to do that. Um, also, we want to remember um, um, Jack Schofer's family and the passing of his grandmother. It's tomorrow. Her funeral services are in Hayhira. Um, also, um, uh, Kevin Garner's father, Wallace Garner, passed away this last week, and uh, another, a lot of that family that's relatives want to continue to remember them in our prayers. Uh, we did have some good news today, and... I'm excited to announce that Tiffany Taylor was baptized into Christ uh, today, so um, I won't make Tiffany stand up, but uh, really, really proud of Tiffany and take a chance to get to know her. She just graduated from Georgia Christian just a few weeks ago, or a week ago, uh, so we're, we're very proud of her. Also, um, don't forget about the cards, visitation team number two, and our cards of compassion. Uh, men's prayer breakfast will be tomorrow at 6.30, and an opportunity, anyone who wants to come can come be a part of that. Uh, if you have prayer requests, uh, but we'll start in the morning at around 6.30. Also, don't forget about the Yak Summer Kickoff. will be this coming Saturday at 4.30 at the Mizell's Cabin. I think it's starting at 4.30 and then kind of going on. I think they're doing a fish fry. Y'all still, still doing a fish fry? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you, Becca James, for actually nodding when everybody else was like, oh. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate that. Um, but that's to be this coming Saturday. Also this coming Saturday, the Young and Hearts will have a luau at Dale and Beverly Kay's home at 5 o'clock. If you want to go to that, please be, the, be, please be sure to sign up tonight so that we have some uh, number about who's going to be there. Um, also, don't forget about this coming Sunday. We will be, be beginning a new quarter. And so this coming Sunday will be our promotion Sunday for um, all of our uh, Bible classes. So if you have been in the third grade and now you're out, you would go to the fourth grade class. Um, if you've been in the Hilltoppers class and it's time to go to the so no, I don't think it works that way. Uh, but uh, th there will be a full uh, load of classes, and you can see those in the bulletin that are available out in the foyer. Also should be in your email. That will all begin this coming Sunday. Also, our Wednesday nights. Of course, this is the last Wednesday night of the quarter. For those of you in the auditorium, um, Hubby wanted me to let you know that there are two shorter lessons tonight. So um, if the when there's a break, don't leave. Uh, but stick around, they'll start the other video, and it should fill up one class period. Hope that's gone well for everyone this quarter. Uh, but next quarter, we will be meeting in our discussion groups. Um, so what you'll remember is that there'll be a discussion guide that'll be in your email. It'll also be at the four, in the foyer on Sunday, and you can look at those things and kind of uh, jog your thoughts and things of that nature. But before that, you need to sign up for a class. Um, everyone should be signing up for a class, and I haven't seen, uh, been back there tonight to see how full that is, but if you don't know where you're going to class next Wednesday night, before you leave tonight, please know where you're going to go to class, and that means you've gone back there and signed your name on, on that piece of paper. Um, that would be m very helpful for everyone. Also, this coming Sunday, there will be an elders, deacons, ministers meeting at 430 in room A4, so um, several things to be going on. But uh, we're grateful that you're here tonight, grateful to spend time in God's Word, and we're going to ask Brother Allard to come and lead us in a word of prayer. Number 667 is the song of invitation, Power in the Blood. Please bow with me. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for this day. We thank you for this opportunity to come tonight and study a portion of your word. We pray, Father, that as we, when we get to the point of leaving here, that we take this knowledge and we talk with other people, Father, and we spread your word and make them understand the dire need to become a Christian. Pray, Father, that you will be with Renee Crosby Barrett as she struggles, Father. We pray that you will be with the family of Jack and Kayla Schofer after the passing of his grandmother and the family of Kevin and 
Puffy Garner and the passing of his father, Wallace. We pray, Father, that you will comfort them as only you can. We pray, Father, that you will be with Tiffany Taylor, that you will allow the people to come into her life, Father, that will help guide her and help her to become a strong Christian woman. We pray, Father, that you will be with the deacons, the elders, the ministers at this congregation, Father, that the things that they do and say, Father, will benefit you and help spread your glorious word. We pray, Father, for the first responders, that you will be with them, for our military, that you will be with them, Father, especially as those who are deployed. You will keep them out of harm's way, wrap your arms around them, and keep them safe every day, Father. We pray, Father, for our government that they will open their eyes to the need to have you involved in everything and every decision that is being made in this country. We pray, Father, that you will forgive us of the sins that we ask forgiveness of, and we ask this in your Son's holy name. Amen. Good evening. Tiffany was uh, my goalkeeper for this year. We won a state championship. I'm super proud of her. Uh, just a wonderful, wonderful person. Please get to know her. Um, just so excited for her uh, and her future. Uh, turn with me to, uh, real quick to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 2 through 7. Uh, this will be a little bit of a a repeat for some of y'all that was in the class of Timothy, uh, but I, we just got out of the um, the uh, silver silver threads, I guess we call it. Uh, that class we just got through studying this book, and I had a, just a wonderful time in there. I, just, I really I really enjoyed being in there uh, with the group and, and studying this these books. We're going to look at three people, okay, that will help us define faithfulness and help us to improve ourselves to be faithful, and, and gives us good descriptions of what a faithful person is in the eyes of Paul speaking to Timothy here. Now, a little background about the church here. This is the church of Ephesus, right? And this church is going through a lot of false teachers and things like that that's occurring there. Paul at the time is in prison, the Roman prison, and he's writing this final letter to 2 Timothy, uh, the book of 2 Timothy. He's writing this final letter to, to his son in the faith, Timothy, for encouragement, for empowerment, to be behind him, to give him strength and to let him know that God will be there to support him through all the things that he's going to foresee and encounter here with this church, okay? Now, when we look at these, these scriptures, we're going to see three characters that pop up. And with the time we have, we're going to not go real deep into these. We're going to look at the surface, but I think they're going to help us tonight for a good devo and help us pull some things out uh, for the week uh, and for, for uh, our Christianity, for that matter. Um, a few things we want to make point of is that the whole book of Timothy is focused on commitment and the Word of God. That is the main highlights here. Without commitment, these things we're going to talk about really don't stick, so to speak. So it's very important that we understand that this commitment is not a commitment of just feeling. It's a commitment of love, of obedience, the same kind of feel or, um, commitment that God showed to us by delivering his son here and dying on the cross for us. So as we look at this scripture, let's read through this, and we're going to pull these characters out, make a little application, and then we'll, that'll be the diva for tonight. Uh, starting at verse 1, it says, You then, my child, talking about Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, okay, entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Key word there, faithful, okay? And the verses we're going to look at after this is going to define what he's talking about this faithfulness means. Now, obviously, there's a whole lot more to this that Paul teaches Timothy in these letters. But this is a good little excerpt here of what it means to be a faithful man of God and a woman of God. Okay, Verse 4, excuse me, verse 3, it says, Share in suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No soldier entangles in civilian pursuits, since his aim is to please the one who enlisted him. Verse 5, and an athlete is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. 
Verse 6, it is, it is the hardworking farmer who ought to have the first share of the crops. And then finally, verse 7, it says, Think over what I say, for the Lord will give you understanding and everything. So let's back up a second. Look at verse 3 and 4, all right? What is the person we're looking at here? Well, this is the soldier, isn't it? And there's two points we want to bring out here in terms of the soldier. He first says that a good, a good faithful man will suffer if you're a good soldier of Christ Jesus, will he not? And I like what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 11.30. He says, if I must boast, I will boast of the things that show my what? Weakness. And before that, we read a lot of the things that happened to Paul in that, in that, in that letter there, right? Now, now, what's interesting about suffering for a Christian is that it does something really unique. It, it reveals God's power in our life. It shows the dependency that we have for, for, with God. And it also shows our respect, our reverence. All of these things are revealed when we suffer. Why? Because it should put us to our knees, shouldn't it? It should bring us back closer to God. It should recognize that I'm not as big as I think I am, and I need God in all parts of my life. So that's why it's a faithful man will, will, will suffer for Christ. 2 Timothy 3.12 says that you will suffer persecution if you're a Christian, and you're living as you are supposed to live. Second point there we want to get from the soldier is a focus, okay? That focus it talks about. Because it says not to entangle it yourself in civilian pursuits. Romans 12, 1 and 2, I like what it says. Verse 1, it says, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living, what? Sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Think about it. A living sacrifice knows why he is suffering, does he not? If you're going to be sacrificed, you're going to know the cause of why you're being sacrificed. Bet your bottom dollar. There's a focus there, right? That happens whenever these things occur. So how do we do this, Paul? Verse 2 says, to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God and what is good and what is acceptable and what is perfect. So by these things, we were a good soldier and found pleasing to God. The next person we want to look at, oh, before I get there, there is a victory that happens. Is there not for a soldier? There, there's a reward, and that is a victory in the battle to overcoming sin. Each of these have a different reward. I didn't bring that up. The next person we want to look at is the athlete at verse 5, and we'll reread that. An athlete is not crowned, okay, key word, unless he competes according to the what? The rules. So there's two things we get from this athlete. We get obedience and preservation of the law, or that is to be God's word. So a, a faithful Christian will do what? He will obey. He will obey God's law. He'll follow the rules. Acts 5.29 says what? We must obey God rather than who? Man. Correct? So we also know that a faithful Christian will preserve the words of God. This is a lesson that Paul really wanted to emphasize to Timothy. Preach the word. Stay in the word. Listen to the things that I'm saying. Watch what I'm doing. Emulate these things. Imitate these things. So a faithful Christian will preserve the word of God. 2 Timothy 2.15, which we all know, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, but what? Rightly dividing the word of truth. So in order for a person to preserve the word of God, they has to dwell within them, and they have to live by example these things. And the reward thereof is what? A crown of life, as we were told the athlete gets. Last person here in our, in our three-point lesson here, the farmer. Now, the, the attributes we get for a faithful uh, person or a Christian, the first one being what? Hardworking, right? That means a, a painful labor. If you look at that word, it actually means painful laboring. It's not going to be easy, is it? To be faithful to God, if you're suffering persecution, as Timothy was in this church, in this environment, with the murders happening, the false teachers that's occurring, it was not going to be easy. If you're living like a Christian, your life really should not be easy because you're running upstream from the world. So a farmer works hard at what he does. Colossians 1 and 10 says, So as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. I like, I like to say this. It, it's, we're talking about patience here. As a, a farmer works hard, he has to have patience for the crop to come in, the fruit to bear, correct? 
And, and I like, there's a saying I like to say, I say, we have to give, allow God time to work. Not that he needs the time, but that I need the time. Sometimes we get impatient. I am guilty as charged. This week I found myself being impatient with God. I needed answers. I wanted answers. And God just says, you need to hold on and wait. And in these moments, brethren, in these moments of weakness, in these moments of suffering, in these moments of waiting, we recognize how small we really are, don't we? And with all of these things, we were found to be a faithful member, a faithful Christian before God Almighty. Psalms 37, 7 and 9 says, Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit. So what is the reward for the farmer? Well, it's the fruit of the labor. With patience and hard work, perseverance. This faithfulness does what? Provides fruit for the Christian. Some we may see real quick, some we may see later on. It takes time in Bible studies and things of that nature. So in conclusion, there's a song that I remember as a kid. I don't really hear it much very often. I'm not fixing to sing it for sure. It's He's Still Working On Me. I don't know if anybody's ever heard this song, but it is a great song. Okay, I'm going to read it to you, and it's this lesson to be yours. He's still working on me to make me what I need to be. It took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth, and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be, because he's still working on me. It's a really cute song, but there's a lot of truth in it, isn't there? So as we strive to be a faithful Christian, we apply God's word to our life, continue to know that we're never going to be perfect, but we should always try to aspire to these attributes and things like that. So if you're, if you're here tonight and you're a Christian and you need the prayers of the church, we offer this opportunity to come forward. But most of all, if you're out of Christ, now is the time to put on Christ and be a faithful Christian to God as together we stand and sing. This is our class at this time.
A reading from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. It's Luke 13, 10 through 17. And he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. And she was bent over and she was not able to stand fully. And Jesus saw her and called to her and said, Woman, you are released from your infirmity. And he placed his hands on her and immediately she was made straight. And she, and she glorified God. And the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, he was saying to the crowd, there are six days in which to work and during them come and be healed and not on the Sabbath. And the Lord answered and said to him, hypocrites, do not each of you loose his ox or donkey on the Sabbath and let it out to drink water? But this woman who's a daughter of Abraham who Satan had bound, behold, 18 years. Is it not necessary for her to be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath? And as he was saying this, his opponents were put to shame, all of them. And the whole crowd rejoiced at the glorious things that were done by him. May God bless the reading of his word. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, we acknowledge that you are God above all. We truly are in awe of you. Please accept the worship we offer you today. Please be glorified by everything that we do and say. Please help us as we try to live with you and for you every day. Please, Father, make us more compassionate, especially as we study about the compassion of Jesus this week. Please enable us to see those who are hurting and struggling. Please use us to help them. Father, we strive to glorify you in all that we do. Please accept our service. Please forgive us when we fall short. Please help us to do better. We honor you. We praise you. We extend to you our lives in the name of Jesus. Amen. Traditionally on Tuesday of lectureship week, we have invited one of our outstanding Bible majors to make our presentation. This year is no exception. It is at once a uh, rather simple and difficult decision. Uh, simple because we have a lot of very outstanding young men from which to choose. Uh, difficult because you have to pick one over the others, right? Uh, but this year, we feel like we've been able to choose someone that not only will represent Fried Hardeman's College of Biblical Studies very well, but will contribute to the conversation that we're having this week. Our speaker today is Cole Wade. He graduated from FHU last year with a Bachelor of Arts in Bible. He is currently pursuing a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, also here at FHU. He's married to Anna Wade and is working full-time at the New Hope Church of Christ in Middleton, Tennessee. Uh, from time to time, one of my former colleagues would say that parents send us some really good kids and we just try not to mess them up. Uh, that's not entirely true, though it is to some degree accurate. Uh, some of our students come to us already with a great deal of ability and presence, and Cole is one of those people. Uh, he has distinguished himself among his peers as an outstanding preacher of the gospel, and we look very much forward to hearing what Cole says today as he talks about in our series, he went about doing good here in chapel, doing good for the helpless, from Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17. Cole Wade. It was over 6,000 days 
that this woman stared at the ground. And she did so because of Satan, because of a spirit that she had that forced her to bend forward and to look at the dirt. I wonder how many times people went up to her and asked her, what's wrong with you? Tell me, why are you the way that you are? And I wonder how many times she had to ask people to help me because I can't reach what's up there. How many times did she cry herself to sleep because she was asking God, God, why am I the way that I am? When are things going to change? One day she walks into a synagogue on the Sabbath and there was a man there named Jesus. And from that day forward, her life changed forever. In Luke chapter 13, verse 10, it says, And he, Jesus, was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and there was a woman who for 18 years had had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight again and began glorifying God. The first thing I want to talk about today is I want to talk about Satan. I hope you hate him. It's a very difficult thing to tell a Christian to hate something. We hate sin because it's evil. It's wrong. We hate all wrongdoing. But what about the one who tempts us to do wrong? The one who's behind the sin in the garden. The one who lied to Cain and told him, it is better to murder him than to change yourself. I do hate him. I hate everything he stands for, everything that he's done, everything that he's done to me, even to my spouse, to my family. Everything he does is wrong. And he did something wrong to this woman for 18 years. We know how bad he is because you go to Mark chapter 9. I'm going to show you how bad he is. Mark chapter 9. We love children, don't we? Mark chapter 9, I believe it's starting in verse 14. We see a man bringing his son, his boy, not a young man, a boy, to Jesus. And let me tell you what happened. A spirit had overtaken this boy. And what this spirit would do is he would throw the boy down. The boy would convulse on the ground. He would be rigid. He would foam at the mouth. He would grind his teeth. And nothing could stop it. Even at times, the father tells Jesus, this spirit would throw my son into the fire and into the water to destroy him. How do you sleep at night as a parent? Knowing that your son could die at any moment if you're not watching him. But I want you to recognize this isn't the bad part. Jesus asked him, how long has this been happening to your son? The dad said about his young boy, this has been going on from childhood. You know, we talk about the most innocent among us. Children are the most innocent. Uh, we have rules. You know, children don't need to be watching that. They're innocent. We don't need to do this to children because they're just too young. They're innocent. They can't handle it. Satan has no laws that he abides by for people he wants to torture. We're at a war with Satan. He doesn't abide by the laws of war. Whatever law he can break to get you and me, he's going to break it. And he will even go after a child, an infant. I hope you hate him. I hope you hate sin. And for 18 years, not only does he have no rules about age, I'll attack anybody. I want him to torture. And when he tortures him, he celebrates. This is great because it's causing doubt. Oh, is, God really is God really true? Is he really good? Not only does he have rules about age, but he, he, he doesn't have any rules about how long he wants to torture you. He'll do it for 18 years. He'll do it for your entire life if he wants to. Satan is not your friend. He is an enemy. He is the enemy. Do not flirt with him. Do not say, how close can I get to him? How close can I get to the edge? 
He will take any opportunity he can to ruin your life. If he could have his way with everyone in this room, everyone would be dead. He's awful. Let's keep reading. But there's a man named Jesus there. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately, verse 13, she was made straight again and began glorifying God. Notice her reaction. Praise God for what has happened. This has been going on for 18 years. He's answered my prayers. She was probably there praying that God would take this away. Notice her reaction. But then notice someone else's reaction. Verse 14, but the synagogue official, the chief, the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the crowd in response, there are six days in which work should be done, so come during them and get healed and not on the Sabbath day. Notice he didn't really address Jesus directly. He just wanted to tell everybody because he knows everybody's going to listen to him because he's important. There are six days where you can be healed. Today is not the day to do it. You need to repent. Instead of seeing the power of God in a miracle and saying, you know what, I might need to rethink the traditions of breaking the Sabbath and what I think about breaking the Sabbath. Because if God is working on the Sabbath through Jesus and allowing a miracle to happen, it might not be sinful. But no, his arrogance shows. I must be right and I must correct him because I have to be right. And he rebukes the woman and he rebukes Jesus. But I want you to notice in verse 15, Jesus is described as with his name in verse 12, when Jesus saw her. But for some reason, I don't want to read too much into this, but for some reason in verse 15, Luke switches the title. He says, the Lord answered. What does Jesus say? You hypocrites. Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, a daughter of Abraham as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? He says, I am not waiting till tomorrow. It's happening today. What was the chief of the synagogue doing? Well, he had a flawed view of breaking the Sabbath, but he also had a flawed view of people. He set his traditions of breaking the Sabbath and his view of breaking the Sabbath over loving his neighbor. And Jesus exposed him. You rebuke the Lord, and the Lord will rebuke you. Buckle up. He says, you untie your donkey, your oxen on the Sabbath. You even lead it away. And not only that, you water them. Three things, three verbs. What did I do? Jesus said, I untied this woman from Satan. She's free. And you're mad at me for that. He elevated the Sabbath over a woman who needed help. We talk about compassion here. There was none in that man. Let's talk about worship for just a moment. I know David Shannon, President Shannon, has already preached a lesson on the man with the withered hand. I'm sure he did a wonderful job. But let's talk about worship. When we meet together, that's so important, isn't it? I love to praise God. Y'all sang beautifully. I love to pray. I love having the devotionals. I want to be at church every Sunday. I want to be there on the Wednesday nights and the other nights that we have seminars, that we have classes so we can grow. Read Hebrews 10. We need to meet together. We need that for encouragement. I've heard people say, I've been to church every, every time the doors are open for 40 years. I haven't missed a single one except one time when there was an emergency. But other than that, I've been there. I'm a faithful Christian. Now, I don't want to doubt anybody's faithfulness, but I do want to ask this question. Do you love your neighbor? Because if you don't love your neighbor, but you're at church every time the doors are open, 
then we're not practicing what we're hearing when we're meeting. When's the last Bible study you had with someone lost? When's the last visit that you gave to someone who needed you? What excuse could you come up with to God to say, I couldn't love them at that moment because there was something else in the way. Have we forgotten the second great commandment? Love your neighbor as yourself. If the world can't look at us and say, those are loving people, then who in the world are we? We're like the chief, but we don't have to be. I don't think that we're that way. I think we do love people. I think we can do better. I think that there's good in everybody here. And we want to love. We want to show people God and, and use good works in our service to show them God loves you. And this is how he loves you. You can know that he loves you because I love you. And I'm being like him. I have an elevated, I have an elevated worship over loving my neighbor. Both are important. Both need to be obeyed. And Jesus was teaching them a lesson. If you love animals more than you love people, there's something wrong. And if you think you can do something and get away with it, and other people can do that same thing and not get away with it, there's something wrong. Read Romans 2. If you preach to others, do you not teach yourself? Let's love our neighbor. Let's be kind like Jesus because he is our master. And he sets people free. Let's end on this last point. He sets people free. Like the chief of the synagogue unties his oxen and his donkey, Jesus unties, he loosens us from Satan. And he loosens this woman from her illness, her 18 year long illness. And he did it even on the Sabbath day. Ephesians 2 verses 1 and 2 says, We're dead in our trespasses and sins. What can a dead person do? Not a whole lot. Romans chapter 5 verse 6, While we were still weak, while we were without strength, what did, what did God do? Christ died for the ungodly. In Luke chapter 4, Jesus says, God has, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to do what? Proclaim liberty to the captives. To set free those who are oppressed. He came to bring freedom. You may have an illness. You may have mental illness, physical illness. That's not the worst illness you've ever had, I'm sorry. Jesus came to set you free from the worst one. And if he's blessed you to cure you from that physical illness, that is wonderful. But on the last note, Jesus is the only one that can set you free. He's the only one that can set me free. And if he has, that's wonderful. I love David Shannon. But David Shannon can't set you free. I love M.B. Hardiman, never met him, but I really love this school. He can't set you free. Your father, your mother can't set you free. Your spouse, your boyfriend, girlfriend, they can't do it. The only one that died for your sins is the only one that can set you free. Leave Satan, be loving, and cling to the one that has set you free. Let's pray real quick. Dear God, we thank you so much for Jesus and the example in this synagogue that he's shown us to love, to love even when times it's difficult, when others would judge, when others would condemn us. Help us to be more like him. We're so thankful for this example and that you give us strength through your spirit and through your word that we can be more like you. God, we love you more than anything. I got a lot of questions from Malchus's story. It intrigues me. Uh, 
the curiosity with me, within me as a Bible student and within you, you think about here's the servant of the high priest who had his ear cut off. And I'll tell you something, I got a lot of questions. And, and even though amongst the questions that I do have and the curiosity that I will remain with me within his story, what I walk away with at the end of the day, and I look at the text in Luke 22, is I stand back and I gaze in awe and I say, wow, looking at Jesus, that's the Savior who I serve. Because in the moments of darkness, he continued to shine his light. I want us just for a few minutes, let's, let's go back to the garden together. And, and however you have pictured this scene as he leads his disciples to the Mount of Olives. Uh, the Bible describes that the night, it was a cold night. You'll remember that later on Peter would be warming himself by the enemy's fire. And, and you recall that in the darkness they would go to the Mount of Olives and there he would lead his disciples and he would commission them to pray. And he would go about a stone's throw further and there he would pray in agony to the Father, Father, let this cup pass from me if it be your will. And he came back and the record records that he did this three times and on the third time when he finds the disciples are asleep, do you recall? It's in the midst of that as he is encouraging them, guys, listen, pray that, that the detachment of troops begin to approach the scene. So we pick up in Luke chapter 22 and verse 47. It says, while he was still speaking, behold, a, a multitude. Now, I don't know how you picture a multitude. But I know that Matthew and Mark both record, they actually give a description to the multitude. They use the language of a great multitude. Would you call this setting right here, would you call this group of people a multitude? I don't know how you perceive or you understand what a multitude looks like. But he says here, a multitude, and actually in John's account, there's a detachment of troops and officers who are present. And it's Judas who is leading this multitude, this group of people into the Mount of Olives, or to the Mount of Olives to approach Jesus. They've got lanterns, they've got torches, and they've got weapons. And so in setting the scene, don't you kind of visualize, I mean, here has been this quiet scene where there has been prayer and Jesus has been talking to his disciples. And all of a sudden, I just picture it like this. There is some type of illumination in the darkness. And now there is a, a mass of people, a multitude of people who are moving in on the scene. I don't know if you can hear the clanking of the weapons. But nonetheless, the scene, it shifts, it changes as this group of people approach Jesus. And it's Judas who is leading. And so you pick up in verse number 47, after the multitude, and he who was called Judas, one of the 12, went before them, and he drew near to Jesus to kiss him. But Jesus said to him, Judas, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? And so you see as he's as Judas has approached, and you remember Judas had gone and he had he had already made negotiations about how much and how it was the method by which he would betray Jesus. And now is that moment by which it's about to unfold. John's account makes me scratch my head a little, little more, my curiosity. I, I read John's account, and when the detachment of troops approach, Jesus Christ asks them, says, whom are you seeking? And they say, Jesus of Nazareth. And you remember how Jesus responds? Ego and me, I am. And you remember the response of this group of people as they have approached the scene that no doubt that they are ready, they are ready to make the arrest, they are prepared in their minds. No doubt this detachment of troops is prepared to do battle if that's necessary. And as they approach, when they hear Jesus say, I am, the Bible says that they draw back and they fall to the ground. Now, you don't just fall to the ground for any reason, do you? 
either there is some type of power going out, or it's possible that when he makes that statement that they are in absolute shock because he is John's the great I am. Before Abraham was, I am. He called himself God. I, I don't know if that's what's happening in John, but I know this, that when they come to arrest Jesus, he makes that statement and he says, Ego and me, I am. They draw back and they fall to the ground. And at some point in this, they put their hands on Jesus to lead him away. You remember that Judas had in his mind that what would happen is, according to Mark's account, that they would seize Jesus and they would lead him away and the description is given safely. They didn't intend for, Judas didn't intend for Jesus to die in these moments. But, but what we see is, and what we see unfolding is, a change from a quiet scene of prayer and petitioning to God and the stress that Jesus had been under, the sweat as drops of blood, and now the, the scene has changed and there are, there's a multitude who are present to arrest Jesus. And Judas, the betrayer. And you pick back up in Luke 22 and it says in verse 49, when those around him saw what was going to happen, they said to him, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? Now you recall, why is it that they have swords? Because Jesus had told them, bring a sword. As a matter of fact, if you rewind to verses 35 through 38, he had actually told them, if you don't have a sword, sell your garment and go buy one. But they responded, hey, we've got two swords right here. And he said, okay, it's enough. So they've got... They've got weapons in order to defend themselves here at the garden. One of those, somewhere in this, says, shall we strike with the sword? And it's almost like instant, all this is happening, it seems like, very quickly. And John tells us that it's Peter who it is that draws his sword. Verse number 50, Luke says, Luke records, and one of them struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Now, <clears throat> I, I've, I've, again, I've envisioned this. I've imagined what this must have looked like, right? I mean, all this is unfolding in my mind very quickly. And here's Peter, and he's got a sword. And, and he pulls the sword out, and somehow he catches the ear of Malchus. Now, I don't think in any regard, we don't get the indication in the Scriptures that he was an excellent swordsman. We don't, we don't find that about Peter. We don't find that Peter went, ding, and it hit the ear and it falls off. No, 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 no. You know what Peter was doing? He was going for the kill and he was trying to make good on his promise in, in Luke 22 and verse 33 to where he told Jesus, hey, I'll go to prison, I'll go to death with you. And he's making good right now on that promise. And what I envision him doing is he, he's going for Malchus's neck, head, and somehow he catches the ear. How is that the case? I was talking to a couple of law enforcement guys in preparation for this and doing a little study. One of those is Travis Harmon at Heritage Christian. And the other is uh, a former student here at Freed Hardeman, Colt Montgomery, who now is in law enforcement. And I asked, okay, so, so when you are doing defense training, what are some things that they teach you concerning when you use the baton? And I, I, asked, I actually asked Colt at church, he worships with us, I said, Colt, are you instructed to strike the head of an individual with that baton? And his quick, immediate response was, oh, no, 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 that's off limits. Unless we're talking about the use of deadly force against them, and then it's a whole different discussion. I said, well, then what's, what's the process by which you use a baton? And he says, you can go for the arm. But most of the time, taking a step, it's to strike the side of the thigh or the calf. Why is that? Hit the nerve right there, and the perpetrator, the per person that they are trying to arrest, goes down, and they are able to apprehend this person very quickly. Why is it you don't go for the shoulder or for the bicep? Used to, they train that way. Not as much anymore. Why is that the case? Because you know the natural reaction of a human being, if you see a, a stick, a baseball bat, some type of object, and it's coming at the upper torso level, you know what your natural instinct is to do? 
That's how I'm picturing this. I picture that, that Peter takes the sword and, and when he does, Malchus all of a sudden goes, and somehow it catches the side of his face, it catches his ear, and now it, Peter has cut off this man's ear. Now again, don't, re, don't let this play out as some type of quiet scene. What is happening is chaos. And in this chaotic scene, all this begins to unfold. Well, how do you picture Malchus in these moments? It, the, the Bible doesn't tell us, does it? I, I, I've got a lot of curiosity about this. I've got a lot of questions. I mean, Luke, he, he knows, medically, he knows he could have told the very, very details of what his ear looked like, of how much he was bleeding, of how he hit the ground, of, of the screams that came forth. You know, if you take your hand and you run it by your ear, you can hear your hand cutting the air, can't you? You're really wanting to do that right now, aren't you? I know you are. <laughs> it's okay if you want to. Malchus did not have that opportunity to hear the sword cutting the air because what it did was it cut his ear. And now in the moments of chaos, what do you, how do you see this unfolding? Do you see the detachment of troops? Now they're drawing their weapons. Is that what it, how it plays out? Are they advancing in this moment? And yet in that moment, in what is called their hour of darkness, in verse number 53, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, he shines forth. What does he do? He says this, let me do this. In other words, Permit me to do this is, is actually the words that he uses in verse number 52. Jesus answered and said, permit even this. And he touched his ear and he healed him. Other accounts will say that he instructed Peter. He said, put up your sword. Put it back in the sheath. Don't you know if this was the way that this was going to unfold? I could right now call for 12 legions of angels and all this is done. I gather from it that Jesus did not intend for the sword to be a, an instrument to advance the kingdom. He's, he told him to bring it defense. It's there, but not to advance the name of Christ or the kingdom. You know what? But Peter would get this a little bit later on, wouldn't he? What, what do you mean? Because he would take, just a little bit further in the Bible, he would take, and he would stand on Pentecost Day, and he would take, the sword of the Spirit. And he wouldn't take it and cut off a man's ear. What he would do is, and actually it's Luke who uses the language there as well in Acts 2, verses 36 through 38. And Peter would take the sword of the Spirit, which is sharper, it's living, powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword. It'll pierce. It'll, to the division of soul and spirit of joints and marrow. And it's a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And the apostle Peter, later on, he would see that power in that sword. And 3,000 would obey the gospel. But here in this scene, you've got the enemy advancing. And now you have Peter, or excuse me, Jesus in this moment saying, whoa, stop. Let me do this. And, and what I want is I want a lot of details. I want a lot of details about Malchus. I want to know how his story unfolds. You know, people have, they have given traditions. They have written stories about what, maybe what happened to Malchus. We don't know. I would love for his story to have been that he was with Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus at the tomb of Jesus Christ. Wouldn't that have been cool? I'd have loved for his story to be that he stood with the apostles there and was in the presence on Pentecost Day when Peter preached. That would have been a really neat detail, but it's not there. You know what is there? Some simple words that the Holy Spirit intended exactly to be there and nothing else. You know, if you take a rifle scope, maybe you take a two and a half by 10 by 50, and you look through that scope and you have it all the way zoomed out, you're seeing a lot of things. Maybe you're trying to focus on one object, but you're seeing a lot of things. But when you zoom that scope in, you get a real good look at the object intended to be focused on. Here's what the Holy Spirit in Luke's account 
intended for us to focus on. And it's the simple phrase at the latter part of verse number 51. And he touched his ear and healed him. That's it. That in a moment of chaos, Jesus Christ introduces the potential for at least a glimpse and a moment of healing and peace. You know what Jesus did not do? See, here's the reality, and here's the main point I want you to go with today. I don't know, if you were to say, my enemies, I would say that most of us, it'd be hard for us really to define who our enemies are. Because we're the kind of people that just like the lectureship has said, we, we want to go about and do good. So who's your enemy? I would venture to say that I probably have enemies that I've never met, I don't know. They don't even really know me. Because I'm the preacher at the Hatton Church of Christ in Hatton, Alabama, just because I fulfill that role, there will be people in this life that despise and hate me. I get that. Maybe though, maybe you have, maybe you've experienced betrayal in your life. Maybe some of the students here, maybe you've experienced having a roommate that was very unkind to you at some point in time. Maybe some of you have gone through some very difficult family problems and you know what betrayal is. And what happened was that betrayal led to them, the betrayer, influencing a group or crowd. And they've said things about you and they've done things to you. And so what do you do? You know what you don't, what we learned from Jesus, you don't mirror the aggression of the aggressor. You don't try and one-up their anger and their wrath and their malice and their hatred towards you. You know what Jesus did? He loved this man. And what Jesus did, does in the garden, in this moment, I still believe he was teaching his disciples. He was giving them the picture of what the disciples have, had learned to love your enemies. And now he's blessing, he's blessing his enemy. In the hour of their darkness, he shined the light. And Christians for ages would continue to shine that light and be the light of the world because they see the big picture that Jesus saw and he recognized and he came to this earth for and that was to seek and to save the lost. And that person who has hurt you and that person who doesn't like you and that person who does evil to you, don't repay them with evil, but repay them with good. Why? For the sake of their soul. See, wouldn't be too long later when Stephen, at the hands of those who would stone him, he would gaze up and he would see Jesus standing at the right hand of the throne of God. And he would say what? Don't charge him with this sin. Luke would help us in Acts to understand a little bit better of how Paul understood all this as well. When Paul in Acts 22 would be standing on the barrack stairs of what we often think is the Antonia Fortress, and there he would turn around after having been beaten and the people there hoping that they could kill him, he turns around and he preaches to them the name of Jesus Christ. Why? He saw the big picture. My heart's desire is that they shall be saved. Let's bow in prayer. Father, we give you thanks for your glory and your example and your son. And Father, we thank you for the challenges. We, we understand that we don't know everything, all our curiosity and all the questions. We understand that you have given us your word and what you intended to give us. And Father, it is powerful. Help us to use your sword of the spirit in the way that you intend and to be and to continue to be that light in a dark, dark world. Father, thank you so much for the example of Jesus Christ. It's through his name we pray. Amen.